Um, hi everybody, uh, my name is Julia. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Hamidullah for inviting me to speak. Uh, my paper uh, today is entitled Travelling Through Cultures, Second Generation British Bangladeshi Muslim Young Women's um, Experience of Culture and Religion. Uh, firstly, I'd like to say a little bit about my research. Uh, it was done on second generation um, British Bangladeshi Muslim Young Women. Um, so second generation in this context means um, her uh, daughters of uh, immigrant uh, of the immigrant uh, generation, and how we, um, myself included, uh, balance British and Bangladeshi cultures. The data that is um, that gave rise to that analysis pointed to the specific relationships within the family um, that are often overlooked when researching Bangladeshis and South Asians in general, particularly intergenerational relations between first generation immigrant parents and their second. Um, generation children, so that's my research in a nutshell. This research was conducted within, with data from a, um, a very specific part of London. Um, I didn't look at Tower Hamlet, just to let you know, first of all. Um, first, first though, I think it's important to give, um, the, I'll give the very briefest outline of the demographics of Bangladeshians living in London, um, and can, how I came to look at the specific parts that I did. Uh, so the narratives recorded in this paper show a glimpse into a certain part of London's Bangladesh community as it's changing. Um, in, a, in a study conducted by the Communities Department of the uh, British Government in 2009, when I started my research, uh, London is home to um, uh, 142,931 Bangladeshi Muslims who constitute 23.5% um, of the total Muslim population and, and make up the largest concentration of Muslim Bangladeshis in the UK. However, the meaning of the particular numbers is not necessarily examined in the government's report. For example, the quantitative data does not exemplify which parts of um, Bangladesh they arrive from, the conditions in which they live, the emotions surrounding their, their migration, and this is something I'll do with my paper, not the degrees of religiosities um, such migrants identify with. So I wanted, um, in my thesis, I argue that it's vital to show the multiple parts of Bangladeshi culture. As many Bangladeshis have migrated from and to different places and under diverse circumstances. So I would say that my thesis offers new insights into changing Bangladeshi society by looking at the areas specifically of Wood Green, Woodford, Ilford and Gants Hill as emerging spaces in which some professional Bangladeshi immigrants have chosen to make their homes. My access as a researcher through attending cultural functions and through family friends led me to investigate these previous, um, previously unresearched populations of Bangladeshis uh, living, uh, living in the London parts of Redbridge and Harry and Gay. Redbridge, where Ilford, um, Gansel and Woodford are located, has a Bangladeshi Muslim population of 3,971. Uh, which constitutes 13.9 of the total Muslim population. This was still in 2009. And Harry Gay uh, Council, where Wood Green is located, isn't even listed. So it was therefore important to uh, examine the range and diversity of experiences of second generation British Bangladeshi Muslim young women living in London and um, as, as of um, such unresearched areas. Uh, so this can serve as a starting point for potential further research into understanding intergenerational dialogue and familial relationships. So my paper, um, so I've taken the next part of my paper from one of my analytical chapters of my thesis, and it's divided into two sections. The first part looks at how the second generation feel about being in Bangladesh and relationships with family there places they can possibly relate to through family, but aren't necessarily the places they grew up in. And the second part of the paper examines the impact of familial relationships on the choices to express religion, particularly in respondents' understandings of how uh, such understandings affect their sense of identity and the relationship to the cultures in which um, they maneuver through. So more broadly, carrying mysteries and speaking from different historical positions, um, is affected when my respondents uh, have been have physically travelled in Bangladesh and the emotions evoked through this, as this paper will look at. Um, it examines the in-betweenness of travelling between Bangladesh and Britain. 
whether young women are allowed to create spaces from which to articulate an understanding sense of self is explored. The complexities between cultures may be highlighted specifically in traveling geographically between cultures. So considering such experience then may give insight into how these tensions can be possibly resolved and whether many young women speaking in my paper uh, might feel more British than Bengali or vice versa. I also consider through uh, intergenerational dialogue, respondents are able to communicate experiences of lived histories with first generation parents. I will explore whether cultural diversity and integration carries the same meanings for my respondents in di different geographical locales. So, the first bit, uh, so how young, uh, how specific young uh, women feel in relation to geographically traveling across cultural histories sheds an important light on how they feel about family um, navigation uh, between cultures and um, the histories they carry. Uh, so being both in Bangladesh and London and the relationships such young women can maintain with the relatives in Bangladesh will be explored. To examine, to, to further understand the types of relationships a young woman might have with her family, I consider um, Tazin's discussion of the types of relationships she has with her extended family in Bangladesh. She was, at the time of this interview, 26 years of age uh, and works in the finance sector. She lives in Gansville with her parents and her family originally from Bushtia, uh, which is on the border of London, or, or border of India, sorry. Um, Um, yeah, so this is Tazin's extract. Um, so I asked her, do you have a relationship or relations with your cousins uh, or your grandparents? And she says, not really. And then through, uh, further, on in the, um, further on in the interview, I'm asking, so what kind of places do you like to go to? She says, hot, where everything's done for you, basically. Luxury. I like luxury. And I, I say, okay, if I said to you that Bangladesh, coming from Bangladesh, Bangladesh has nice hot beaches and five-star hotel, which it does, um, would you have considered the going there more on a day? She says, no. I asked her, why not? She says, I don't know. Going to Bangladesh doesn't seem like a holiday. It seems like an obligation. And I don't think, do things that I feel uh, people are obligating me to do them. I do things because I want to do them. Uh, so I say, why would that be an obligation to you? And she says, just because there would be the expectation, I suppose. I can never see anyone who's got relations in Bangladesh going to Bangladesh and not staying with their family and staying with them. It's very interesting here because Bazin touches upon an important point where she explains that there are certain expectations she feels she has to live up to. Uh, expectations that are put upon her from her extended family relations. Uh, uh, this is similar to what is expected, resisted, allowed. Um, whether that works on the community, that can be open for discussion later on. Um, it also exemplifies for the young woman who might not share close relations with her relatives who live in Bangladesh. There is no dialogue because uh, she might not be able to um, speak the language. Dazid, for example, expressed elsewhere, well, earlier in the way, in the way they got out the interview, that she feels that she's not effectively able to communicate in Bengali. Moreover, Tazin explains that she cannot Im uh, imagine second generation uh, Bengalis, regardless of gender, uh, not staying with or visiting relatives upon arrival to Bangladesh. She explains that she likes convenience and luxuries where holidays for her and really relaxing on sandy beaches. I argue that this is significant, as uh, she would be visiting family with whom she has little in common with, uh, or has, sorry, uh, little communication with. And this may lead to a tense situation where she can't relax. So it may mean that also, be, uh, also that because of the lack of communication, due to the language barrier, she is unable to pick up, on, pick up on the nuances of the culture once she is in Bangladesh, and therefore, in some way, adapt to her surroundings. In Tazin's case, a lack of communication might give rise to tensions that do not allow for a relaxation, which she associates holidays with. As a result, it becomes difficult to maneuver between certain histories, as she is uncertain how to do so. This could possibly be a factor as, you, as to why she is unable to travel to, unwilling, sorry, to travel to Bangladesh and feels like it's an obligation to see her relatives. 
This makes language an issue in relation to traveling between Bangladesh and India. Sushmita, on the other hand, um, feels very differently about traveling to Bangladesh and seeing her relatives there. Sushmita, at the time of interview, is 29 and a dentist. She lives with her parents and younger sister in Milford. And um, her family come from Tangai. So she says, um, she, was, uh, she was speaking about uh, actually being in uh, Bangladesh and traveling to see her relatives. And for her, that was amazing. That has been a really rustic, uh, that's been really rustic. And I can't believe there are people who still live like that in the world and they're related to me. My life is just so different to theirs. It's just, I think in that way I feel very Bengali because they're my people, they're akin to me, you know? I ask this, sure. And she says, so when I think of my relation, relations, I think of myself as Bengali, but otherwise I'm British like this. Um, so I ask her, so that in itself is contextualized. She says, yeah, when, I, when I'm there, I hate people, uh, that people think I'm a memchai or something or whatever. I don't like it when I'm in Bangladesh. They look at me like I'm a foreigner um, because I think of myself as one of them when I'm there. But when I'm here in London, I think of myself as a British person. So it emerges that Sushmita feels Bengali only when she's in Bangladesh and feels British if she were to be anywhere else in the world. It is interesting, it is interesting that um, Sushmita explains that um, her, her relatives who live in Bangladesh are her family and that people should not let her look upon her um, as foreigner because she feels herself to be one of them. Sushmita feels intense bonds with her family in Bangladesh that she does not necessarily feel with her was in London. Hence, there might be the emphasis uh, that those residing in Bangladesh are her people, and she would like to view them as such. And yeah, so it's through acknowledging uh, I argue that one's parental histories, I argue that uh, one can link or be linked to one's geographical histories. The closeness with one's parents might be there, might allow this to happen. If, for example, one is unable to. Uh, close with one's parents and their histories, then this uh, perhaps makes these familiar histories distant. So there is, um, in, in this way, a certain level of responsibility in keeping up to certain expectations for the young woman who has spoken in this section. So for instance, Fuzzy, whose voice we heard um, just a little while ago, uh, might not want to travel uh, to Bangladesh and see her relatives because she, because she might not be, uh, she might not feel that she's able to live up to these expectations, that, that she feels are placed upon her. Sushmita, on the other hand, feels akin to her relatives when actually in Bangladesh. But it's interesting to know that once she's actually in Bangladesh, that she feels Bengali because of the heritage given to her by her parents and the close bond, bond that they share. Uh, this is reminiscent of psychoanalyst Sudhir Kapar's argument that societal and communal values are transmitted to the family. And I argue that the dialogue, uh, that dialogue, which is a dialogue like play an important part in this transmission. So where there's little dialogue, there might be, ten uh, there might be tension in relating to the wider community of the family, for example, with Desmond. Um, again, this might entail a sense of what is acceptable with the family and the commun uh, community more broadly. Um, so, the, uh, as Nira Yuval Davies calls it, the emotional attachment this entails and the complexities that surround us. Indeed, it is clear that negotiating such a position is not easy. Feeling a sense of responsibility in living up to certain ideals is something that has been expressed by many respondents. Many of the young women want the, uh, want, one of the young women, sorry, uh, wants the parents to feel that they have been bullied children. Uh, by, not being, by their parents not being ostracized and therefore to protect them in some way. Whereas the other might feel that she is unable to handle, handle the pressure of living up to certain ideals. Some young women, depending on, uh, on the ease with, uh, with which they identify with particular histories and the kinds of relationships they have with their parents or family or more in general, find it easier to explore and navigate, uh, maneuver through uh, different historical cultures than others. This points to a questioning of who is accepted within the community and who is allowed to speak and who is not allowed to speak. This can be further uh, examined in Sushmita's 
um, uh, extract. So, uh, we were speaking earlier uh, about notions of independence, um, and she, she has um, a place uh, outside, uh, she, has, she lives in a flat where she studied. Um, so I asked her, you were telling me about independence and your parents want you to be independent in a big wide world. But she says, this is my true home and the interview was conducted in her parents' house. Um, so I asked her, because your parents are in it? And she says, yes, because, and my sister, because we're all here. Um, but then she says, but I thought it's necessary. All my friends told me it was necessary for me to, take, to, to make a move and stand on my own two feet. And stuff, and, and my mum and dad were always quite supportive of it. They were like, "Yeah, you need to be able to do this," but they missed me a lot. Even though I speak to them every day, and I try and come home almost every weekend, unless I've got plans on, unless I've got lots, to, lots of work to do the next week or something, I will come home. But I think they found it quite hard because of the other house we are, because we all depend upon each other so much. But then emotionally, we're all very uh, much involved with each other. Even though they can talk to me on the phone, it's not the same thing as having me here in person. It's not quite as um, an engaging conversation. Um. She says, so I don't, think, uh, I don't know whether it's because I'm so dependent on them because we are so close. A lot of my white friends, uh, they just can't understand how we, how we how we can be so close because their own relationships with their parents are such that they are close, but they don't feel the need to have half hour kinds of conversations with, them, with their families every day. I ask her, do you think it's an Asian thing or a Bengali thing? Or She says, yeah, maybe it's a Bengali thing. I definitely think it's an Asian thing. She says, family is very central to your life if you're Asian. It's my italics. And whether it's specifically Bengali or not, I'm not sure. Because I think it depends on the type of family you have, your parents and your brothers and sisters. If you're comfortable, then you want to be here, you want to be there. And if you're not, you don't really. I have Bengali acquaintances who don't really talk to their parents much. They don't spend as much time um, at home, although they live at home. Um, and she says, but they spend less time there at home than I do. And I, I don't live there, I don't live here most of the time. So I think it depends on the type of family, whether they do shame for the do, do do share things or not emotionally. So be, perhaps because of the uh, the closeness and, and the familial attachment, she finds it hard to leave. Uh, she she finds it hard to leave and every time she needs to, to go back to her workplace. There appears to be a clear boundary for Sushmita between the outside and the inside world. Um, inside, it's Sushmita's home where family, parents, and sister reside and people with whom she's emotionally attached. The outside is territory that she's unfamiliar with. And she cites um, cultural differences between friends. Um, and Sushmita emphasizes that for, for her, uh, the key to her in comfort in these histories and the relationship she has with her families is the emotional detachment. She cites, for example, young people of her own generation who, although living at home with their own parents, spend very little time uh, with their own family. Um, so you, I suppose you could, it could be possible to say that there, where there's little um, dialogue um, uh, in, the, in the home, there, there, there's possibly uh, little emotional attachment within the family. That's a possibility. Okay, well, I'm on to the second bit now. Um, and this part, um, Examines the culture and traveling uh, culture and traveling between different histories in the context of religion. It must be stressed that even though this research was conducted after the atrocious attacks of September 11 and during July 77, these events did not play um, a large role in how my respondents viewed religion or how they were viewed, or how they were viewed as Muslim women, um, since many did not wear the hijab or cover their hair. Here, the first two women reflect upon the question. The importance of uh, the importance of religion, and the last two women speak of actually being in Bangladesh. I've got one, sorry. Uh, actually, being in how their perceptions of religion have changed and the questions that such changes provoke. 
I also want to stress uh, that rather than looking at religion per se, uh, I wish to use religion to highlight questions and it's a means through which communication can either occur or not, and so, as in some cases between, um, between uh, generations. Khalida, for example, speaks of the importance of language in relation to religion and expresses a distinct ambivalence towards Bengali culture. She, explained, uh, she explains what religion means for her in such circumstances. And Khalida is 24 years old and a master's student in sociology. She lives in Woodford and her family are from Parma. She says, I ask her, would you say that Islam um, as a religion would be a form of escapism in Bengali culture? She says, yes, um, it feels like that sometimes. I ask her, it does? She says, because it doesn't consist of a certain language. Uh, because, as she puts it, religion does not consist of a specific language. For her, it might provide an easier means for Khalida to express, uh, express a sense of self. Earlier in the interview, Khalida expre uh, explained that she does not feel, feel comfortable with speaking in Bengali, and uses it primarily to speak, communicate with her father. As Islam is based upon certain rituals and behaviors rather than any particular language, she feels solace in it. Indeed, Islam can be used as Takara argues to contest religious orthodoxies and for Khalida, religion is perceived as more liberating than Bengali culture. There is more space for negotiating, negotiation and understanding sense of self for her particular um, case. Um, uh, Khalida, just uh, she was one of my respondents that just uh, she, she, I think she was the only one who wore a hijab, perhaps. Yeah. Um, so she, uh, so she says, um, in Britain, in Britain, I don't think of myself as a Muslim. I just think of myself as a Muslim. I so ask, uh, say, okay, so why is that different from being, say, uh, Asian or Bengali? And she says, because uh, mus being Muslim overrides all, being a strong Muslim person. I say perhaps somewhere there's a, some uh, some sort of Islamic like cultural, given the history of uh, given the, yeah, so Islamic cultural something. Um, and she says, if that's the case, then uh, that, that's the best culture because Beng Bengali culture sucks. That's uh, so why you say that. I apologize for saying that. Um, uh, because I hear my dad sometimes say that you don't do this in Bengali culture, you do that. And I'll be like, well, hold on, I'm a Muslim, so in Muslim culture, it says this, and it always turns out to be better than Bengali culture. I say, uh, would you say you come from a very religious family? And she says, no, not as such. My father's a very practicing Muslim, and my mother's not as much. She said, um, so I say, so is that more like, influential to you than your Bengali side? And she says, no, no, yeah, that my dad's a uh, practicing Muslim. Uh, yeah, in, in establishing new identity. So it's not a point. She says, yes. So Khalid, for, for Khalida, her religious heritage is uh, very important to her. She argues that her religion involves both Bangladeshi and British cultures. There um, arises a strong notion that Khalida uses religion as a defense against um, as a defense against certain practices which her father asserts as being from Bangladesh culture. It appears that she dislikes being told what to do, and some of her behaviors and preferences might contradict her parents, especially her father's understandings uh, of Bengali culture. Interestingly, however, it is her father who is, she explains, more religious than her father. This raises questions about how much dialogue exists between the generations of this family, uh, as there seems to be a parallel how she describes her father and the importance she herself attaches to Islam in shaping her identity. This com the complexities in the relationship between first generation father and second generation daughter are once more highlighted in Khalida's extract. Elsewhere in the interview, Khalida described her father as often often absent, but she knows that uh, she says she knows he loves her dearly. Perhaps uh, her attempt, uh, attempt to identify with her father shaped her sense of identity, religious identity, and she possibly identifies with him in this way. I, re um, there's, I raised the psychoanalyst Erickson <coughs> argument that the individual's identifications in childhood, um, in this case the father, shapes their identity. 
So perhaps Khalida, uh, Khalida's father's religiosity has influenced her more so than her Bangladesh culture, which she says sucks. There is a possibility that the daughter positions her father somehow in the context of the mind, when he is representative of two things. Firstly, he might represent religious identity, uh, where she hints that there's more space for dialogue. And secondly, he might represent Bangladeshi culture. Khalida obviously identifies uh, more with the former than the more formal, with the former more stronger than the latter. That she feels that religion is a strong part of her identity is visibly displayed by her wearing a hijab. Of this, she says, I only started wearing the hijab recently, like a year ago. I said, okay. She says, it wasn't as, as hard as before, very hard before because I was just the Asian British. Now I'm the Asian British making the statement that I'm Muslim, that I wear the hijab. So I say, okay, that's interesting. I mean, why a year ago? Why not before? Why not later? And she says, oh, because I didn't get the influence before I got it a year ago. I ask her, what was your influence? And she says, oh, that's a very, very personal one. But it's more like a friend who encouraged me, uh, guided uh, me back then. And I ask her, so did that have anything to do with your family? Um, my family were all there all the time telling me about the hijab and teaching me about it and the importance of it. Um, but I didn't take them all. They never forced me. They just said, it's an optional thing. When you're ready, you can put it on. And although um, Khalida is not very specific about uh, who the friend is who guided her to wear the hijab, her explanation nevertheless reflects that friends from outside the family are often important um, in understanding the sense as well. I've written about this um, in, a, in a different place. Um, indeed, an outside influence is, is needed in order to understand one's um, innocence, perhaps. Kalina's family did not pressure her to wear a hijab. Rather, she makes it clear that it is a, uh, it is a choice. Although it, 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 sorry, it appears that there is an expectation that she should wear one. It is a friend who is outside the family who encourages and guides her. There is the difference in the argument between the family's expectations and that of the friend. It appears that Khalida emphasizes the support of her friend in, in her choice to wear the hijab, more so more than that of the family. However, this might um, have to do more with the relationships within the family than without it. And Khalida's notion of religiosity um, contrasts uh, with the Sushmudas. Uh, and So I ask her, okay, we talked a little, bit about, um, a little bit about your Bengali, your British influences on, on your identity. Do you think you have a Muslim side? She says, um, I'm a little bit mixed up about religion. I, I just see that religion seems to complicate things in society. I ask her, okay, can I ask if your parents are religious people? She says, no, but not either. They're more religious than I am. But my dad was telling me last week that I that I, as in he, has decided that I'm people, I'm going to tell people that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a questioning Muslim. I think when my mother is uh, more religious than my dad, she doesn't really impose it on, on us, except when she tries to tries to make my sister read surahs, just because she feels that it's her duty to teach us something. And I've been taught that, so she feels as, that as a parent, my sister should know something, um, other than what we've been taught at school. But that's all. She doesn't try and force it on us or anything. So, um, contrary to Khalida, Sushmita is unsure about her beliefs in religion. At the same time, however, the notion arises that religion is deeply personal and should not necessarily be imposed on others. For Sushmita, the presence of religion further complicates things in society. Religion might make it difficult for some certain young generation, second generation, uh, British, Bangladeshi, Muslim women to negotiate this space, which is already, which might already be contested uh, within a certain Bangladeshi community. Um, so Shmita, uh, suggests that uh, man uh, maneuvering through cultures between different cultural histories <coughs> might be less complicated without religion. <coughs> Um, and indeed, she questions her beliefs rather than emphasizing blind faith in what she's been taught by religious leaders. Words such as controversy and competition, uh, and, and 
this is a truncated version, but the longer one had uh, controversy and competition make their way into Sushmita's narrative when, um, when she argues that she wants a nice and comfortable life, assertions which are reminiscent of her reflections on falling in love and establishing relationships out of Bengali culture. And I've looked at this um, somewhere else. Sushmita points out that her parents are more religious than she is, but do not enforce this religiosity upon their children. Indeed, the notion of questioning religiosity is brought forth by, uh, through the conversation with her father. Um, and I've discussed um, her relationship with her father in a different chapter. <laughs> However, it is Sushmita's mother who wishes Sushmita's younger sister to know and understand certain uh, religious texts, um, as these are not taught in the mainstream education system. And it's her mother uh, who might feel that such instruction is a parental duty a notion that might have arisen through her own upbringing. Um, and this is reminiscent of um, another quote by, uh, again, similar, the psychoanalyst um, Sundir Kakar, who argues that how a parent is brought up necessarily influences how they bring up their own child. So, although Sushmita says that she knows these texts too, she argues that her mother does not um, enforce such religiosity upon her. But this might be because Sushmita, although very attached to her family, does not live at home with her sister, like her sister. The notion of questioning religion is raised by Sujata in a different way. Um, and Sujata is age 27, a trainee accountant, and lives in, uh, lives in with Woodford with her family who come from Kaka. So Sujata says, I don't pray five times a day. Although I am a believer, I'm very strong about my faith. And I practice it in my own way, but I don't wear a hijab. I won't wear a hijab. Ask her why. She says, it's not something that's me. I wouldn't do that uh, personally, though I understand how that's supposed to protect you. It protects you in the Bangladeshi environment. Like, I've had uh, black ulna. Everyone knows what ulna is, yeah? Okay. Um, every time I go out in Bangladesh, I won't have, um, if I don't have somebody with me, I will, I'll have a black ulna. Just in case um, I'm stuck there, I'm stuck somewhere, I just have to cut my hair and my head with And that just keeps the attention away. So it does protect you. And that's what I think, think that we can't do. Uh, it protects you. Like in Saudi Arabia, maternal uncle is white and wears a niqab. But she is Christian, she's Filipino. <clears throat> she wears a niqab, but that's what, that's what um, they're, everybody's doing that. And that's the only way to protect yourself. If you're wearing it, um, if you're wearing one, then I will wear one too. But she says, but in this country, in England, if I were a war in a car, instead of feeling protected, I would feel <coughs> I was being singled out. So me personally, if I wore a car, I would be uh, bringing more attention to myself. And the car is supposed to divert attention. That's why I would have, I would have um, Just a point there, the so Woodford is a very, um, a kind of a white area. I don't know if you know of it, uh, about when she she was growing up, there weren't very many Asians there. So this is this is what she, perhaps what she's saying that she did um, she, she did it on a daily basis. Um, so it emerges that for uh, Sujata, um, there are different levels of religiosity, and in particular, religion means different things to different people. She gives a strong argument of how there are different ways of expressing religiosity without losing one's belief in without looking a specific way. It is important to understand that just because a young woman might not wear a hijab, this, this does not mean that she is irreligious. Rather, there is choice in, uh, choice in Suzyata's expression of religion and spirituality. And as she states in her extract, she's strong in her faith. I argue that articles of religion, I therefore argue are that articles of religious clothing can be used to hide one's physical self so the meaning behind the clothing item differs, uh, differs from wearer to wearer, and why it could not always be understood by the onlooker. For instance, the niqab of Sujata was more of a disguise than anything else. And as Sujata indicates, how religiously one dresses might indeed depend upon one's geographical location. For example, she says she, she, says she dresses in a specific way to avoid being uncomfortable and attracting attention. So perhaps it's to protect herself from the exclusion that Sujata abstains from uh, dressing so-called, you know, religiously, given what we said already, in a non-Islamic location. 
That's where I certain governments might be culturally specific rather than always having all of that rather than always having religious connotations, as well as I'm attaching different meanings to the items of religious clothing that they wear. People uh, also wear them for a variety of purposes. Um, and this relationship between identity and re religious expression gets <coughs> more interesting when young women are actually in language. Um, this, this often confusing relationship can be examined in the following extracts of, of right on this interview. Um, the confusion might particularly be pronounced in uh, situations when different adults have conveyed contradictory expectations. In this, in this, in the extract, uh, Raihana tells of an incident um, that occurred in Bangladesh when she was with her parents and when they went to visit a healthy person. Raihana uh, is at the time of interview 25 years old and is studying to be an accountant. Her family originally <coughs> from Russia in Bangladesh. And I apologize, but I don't have a slide for this because I didn't think there'd be enough time, but I've been told I can say this. So. Um, so, Raihan says, so we visited an elder um, person in this town, the elder or something, but I was only about to choose on the 10 to 10 or something. Her sister was younger and her brother was even younger, and they visited the elder person, and um, they said their salams to salams and everything. But, mo but her mother kept telling her um, to, say your, to say her salams properly, uh, her and her sister. Uh, and then she says, um, no, sorry, I asked her, what, did she, what do you mean by she, your mom kept asking uh, you to salam her? Uh, and she said, exactly, I didn't know either at the time. But what she meant was to go and touch the old lady's feet. Um, and I know this is, you know, in Bangladesh, there are, it differs for, for different communities. Oh, I, so I said, um, oh, that's salami. I, it always makes me feel very uncomfortable. And she says, yeah, I felt very, very uncomfortable too. I've never done that before. It was really awkward. My mum told, uh, told me to touch her feet. But I asked her why, and she said, don't argue. Um, she would tell me later. So I went forward, not really knowing what to do. And by the, um, and by the way, uh, our old Molly uh, told us that you should never bow your head down to anyone other than uh, God. So I was really confused. So I, I bent to touch her feet, not knowing how to do it or what to do. Um, but and she she thinks that the older person understood this, uh, but the, that this girl has never done anything like this. And I asked her, how did she know? And she said, because she was the older person was laughing by this time. She just patted me on the head and told me to get up. I wasn't used to this sort of thing before. And later, my dad asked my mum. Uh, why she made us touch the old lady's feet. And my mom said that all the other people's kids were doing it, so we were supposed to do it too. It wouldn't look right if we didn't. But he said that um, it wouldn't have mattered anyway because we weren't, uh, we weren't used to that part of the culture. So it seemed awkward for everybody. So in her narration of this incident, Raihana explains the complex outcomes of confusing religion and culture. Here, cultural differences also point out in these circumstances um, the, the boys, uh, the gender, there's a gender, gender issue. Although they, uh, she, we haven't explored this. Raihana's uh, discomfort in this situation illustrates that when one is unused to pass on certain by the Bangladesh culture, it's harder to, uh, to maneuver between cultures because the nuances associated with particular aspects of certain rituals are not understood. Such confusion is in greater in confused spaces. Um, the elder in the anecdote understood that Raihana was foreign, foreign uh, to the cultural practices. Her mother strongly wanted her to do foreign and into her head. Here then, it might be argued that there is a yearning by the mother to fit in with the local customs to belong. She wants to fit in through her daughter and hence asks why the to touch the elderly woman's feet. Um, Kondaga explains that uh, the roles of Bangladesh women are varied. They cannot be reduced to, they, they can't be reduced to a distinction between modern versus tradition. There's, there's a lot of leeway in between. This might explain why the situation was not made a great deal of, uh, by the other as present. 
It was only my Jerome's father, who was also confused, who raises uh, questions about the his children or were asked to touch the feet of the elderly lady as highlighted in the, in the extract. It appears that he realizes that his children might not be aware of the differences in customs and is more empathetic towards, towards him than his wife at that specific time. Raihana points out that by touching the elderly woman's feet, contradicting what she was told by the religious teacher, further giving the rise to confusion. However, for Raihana, uh, this confusion might have led to a sense of disruption from being uh, presented both as a foreign child and as the daughter of a woman with a desire to belong. As the situation is unexpected and, is therefore, and she is therefore un, uh, un, unsure of how to behave, the situation becomes awkward. Um, so I come to the end now. So, to conclude, I've argued through my respondents that the relationship between certain young women and her parents can prove potentially uh, crucial in forming the young woman's relationship with her cultural histories. Some may choose to embrace this relationship, others may not uh, choose to. It might depend upon how she understands um, the choices she makes to resolve potential tensions. This can be also be um, explored with the dyna dynamics of the community where first generation Bangladeshis are present. This paper has focused on the changing nature of intergenerational relationships in different spaces, uh, the negotiation and renegotiation between young women and community, and, yeah, and, and also the young women's feelings in Bangladesh. The relationship she establishes with her family, who are actually in Bangladesh, and how she feels, um, how she might feel when she's actually in Bangladesh, are critical in shaping uh, the way that you, the way a young woman might position herself in relation to her cultural history. The kind of relationship she has with her extended family might also depend upon the relationship that she has with her immigrant parents. I have argued that there are different ways in which not only cultural histories but religion can be perceived. As, it, as has been reflected in, in the narratives of young women whose voices have been heard here today. At, at times, religion can be seen as a form of escapism if history has become in any way burdensome, although this, this isn't the case for all young women. Religion does not necessarily have to be visible uh, uh, through the hijab, for example. There are various ways in which religion and spirituality can be expressed and felt. Indeed, I've argued that there are different differing levels of religiosity expressed through a sense of self. There is a possibility that um, the religiosity one feels might stem from the influence of one's own parents. There is also the danger, however, that at times religion and certain cultural practice can get confused. This understanding is negotiated by the maneuvering of young women through and between different cultural spaces and histories. But living in, a, in two different cultures might mean there is more scope for creativity in that through, um, in there is, through travel, religion, etc., um, the new ways of understanding yourself um, and being, uh, yeah, uh, which might lead uh, young women to uh, maneuver between cultures, giving rise to a more in-depth understanding um, of a sense of identity. Um, and she's saying that when she's in Bangladesh and 
she doesn't have anyone with her for protection. She uses that as, as kind of disguise. Um, and the other one, the, the other one, young woman was um, as a kind of a reactionary, perhaps a protest against her father. Um, she didn't get along with her mother. I, I think we can talk about this later if you want, but she didn't really get along with her mother, and she uh, she didn't speak Bengali except her father. And this was a way of um, yeah, Islam was a kind of a trajectory that she, as a, as a, as a sense of defense against um, certain cultural practices. Yeah, my question is really whether the covering of the head was to protect her from the attention of men or for a religious reason. Um, it was, you, it was a, um, which, which, you know, which, which woman? Um, the one in Bangladesh? Well, both of them. I mean, is it, is it a, it a gender issue or a religious issue? It, um, I think I've, um, I kind of highlighted that. Um, it, it, it means different things to different people. Yes. Um, so, um, for one young woman, it can be uh, a trajectory <laughs> through, uh, you know, she doesn't get on with her parents or her father. Uh, religion is a, a, a trajectory of understanding herself better, so that might be a, a, um, a way of why, an understanding why she's wearing a job. Um, so it can be both religion and uh, a sense of identity. The, uh, the other one was more protection than religion. Mm. Uh, no, I just wanted to clarify okay. that because, uh, well, it's not even important, isn't it? Okay, thank you so much. I mean, if women have to cover their heads for protection. Okay, uh, are you ready to come forward? Please. Uh, I, I just haven't, I can speak for you. Hello, um, I'm just going to be there. Yeah, I'm going to be there. Um, I think at one point, I'm not sure if I wrote it, but you said something about um, these women's sense of ident religious identity wasn't impacted by um, the 9-11 and the 7-7 situation yeah. because they're, they're not hijab wearers. No, I said, right? No, not all of my, I guess I, I, I should have specified that in a bit clearly, not all of my um, respondents wore the hijab. Not all of them did. But is there an implication, I don't know if that's what you're saying, or that they were saying, that um, if you're not a hijab wearer, then it doesn't, these situations, political situations or events like 9 11, service of them don't have an impact on you. Um, your no, this is the one my, I just wanted to contextualize when I was doing it um, rather than say um, that these, that these, uh, that the, the, these events have impacts on my. Um, uh, responses as, as like um, the, the relationships they have with their families. It's, it's not overnight, it's obviously. So um, whether these these have impacted upon, um, I don't I don't think they they did because it was, for some it was visible, some it wasn't. But they, it wasn't um, very specified in the interviews, as, so it wasn't that much of an issue. It's these events, these particular events. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Have you, do you have any plans to revisit your respondents in um, follow-up periods of 10 years and 50 years in order to deliver greater richness to your research? Uh, 10 years and 50 years? Uh, yeah, did they just random figures? Um, 10 years, I'm not sure. Um, some of the uh, young women I um, lost touch with. Um, so uh, and, and, and when I was actually conducting my interviews, there were some. I asked for follow-up interviews, and <coughs> someone was just like, "No, we don't have the time." So I just did them for one hour. It was about uh, two hours each, so it was unbiased. Even then, they were like, "No, we don't want to do it anymore." Um, so I, that is depending on uh, that would depend on uh, the ten years. Fifty years. I don't know if I'd still be alive. <laughs> this time, so, um, it doesn't have to be you specifically, but just that you develop that in because we're not the same people as, as 15, 20 year olds. Yeah. We're entirely different to the time we're 40 and 50. Absolutely. And that to give um, credit to the respondents, to have the opportunity to reflect on themselves and their thoughts and decisions when you interview them, to how they've been able to process that into their identity. And I feel 
for identity politics, especially as an academic subject that we teach in this country, it would give greater richness to your research. No, absolutely, I agree with you, but it's, um, I, it's interesting you said that. I was thinking uh, for further research would be an, an interesting way to, uh, when, when uh, my uh, respondents became mothers, for example, that would give a different way of uh, understanding the sense of identity because she's carried a baby, she's done this, she's, uh, you relate to yourself in different ways. Um, so that would be interesting, but there are so many things that people might grow <coughs> They might not be here in 50 years' time, etc. So, yes, definitely. But I think um, I would, I, I don't know if I'd be revisit these part of specific people um, because, um, yeah, like, like, you know, a lot, a lot can happen, but and not all respondents will get the same answer, obviously, as we've seen, you know. So, it's, it's very subjective, I think. So. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for a very, very interesting talk. Um, for me, it brought up as an Irish woman. Uh, for me, it brought up things as an Irish woman. I mean, there are there's quite a lot of parallels between um, the Indian experience and the Irish experience. And, um, I was just intrigued that as you were speaking, I was finding some resolutions within myself about my own experiences. So my father who spent his early years in um, Bengal and was bilingual and um, English Hindustani left when he was ten in nineteen thirty-three. And he could see the point to the um, Irish language. He thought it was excessively zealous on the part of the Irish nationalists, although his Father's second cousin was Michael Collins, the independence leader. He just thought, you know, this is excessively nationalistic, imposing the Irish language, and you can't get your leading trip unless you have it in the Irish language. So he stopped me from learning it at school, because decided Latin, no, Irish, no. And eventually took us out of the education system. And it has a sense of loss as an adult that if I go back to my own country, Ireland, there are certain places, but no English is spoken. Right. And there is that sort of sense of when I go there because I don't speak with an Irish accent, having been brought up in Australia and then years and years as an adult, but the sense of um, this is my country and I love it. And to the local people who don't, didn't remember me as a child, I'm a stranger and I'm treated like a tourist. And this sort of discomfort, I don't know. I, I wish I were local. And um, a sense of some travelling is a little alone. But um, you know, sometimes I want rosary beads in Italy. Uh, both for religious reasons and for protection. So again, for me it's interesting that I would not appreciate it. But um, Muslim ladies were wearing the hijab for a variety of reasons, including religious. So just just for me, it was sort of, yeah, thank you. It's just sort of brought me back to sort of my own sort of inner self and um, uh, realised, you know, if you had more things in common than I'd even appreciated. Can I ask you a question? Um, when you were taking out of school for the... Can I um, just wanted to ask you a question when you, when you narrated um, that specific part of your history, that when you were kind of taken out School by your father, but as Irish wasn't deemed necessary. How did you feel at the time? Um, it was a highly unusual thing to do in Ireland, and it took my sister and myself out. My sister's three and a half years older, and so initially there was great elation because it was like a fish out of water. As an adult. I realised um, with further conversations with my father as I got more deeply into a bit with De Gaulle, and I realised that um, my father had been, to a certain extent, living De Gaulleian <coughs> values, De Gaulleian philosophy, without me realising it. So he couldn't bear the fact that we were broke learning at school and um, a bit like, you know, Toto Kahini, that we had just been stuffed and killed. And so that was all part of the reasoning 
that um, he went up to the school convent one time and <coughs> awaited the nuns for, you know, you know, the way you're teaching these children, I mean, what comprehension do any of them have about what you're sort of like the forcing down them? And you know, really robust. None of the parents were doing things. For, for me, there was a sense of relief. And my sister was a very different personality, and she fitted into the convent, but I was like my father, questioning everything in the born rebel, so I just didn't fit. And then over the course of the 15 months we were out of the school system, um, there was increasingly a sense of sort of loneliness that at the point of the six hours of lessons at home, and we couldn't go out, we couldn't go swimming, we couldn't go out, do anything. That had to be done. After that, we could a time was our own. So then a year later, again being an absolute rebel, my father put me into a Protestant grammar school. This is in Holy Catholic apartheid, Dublin. We were apartheid in religion. <coughs> Separate um, religious schools, um, lawyers for the Protestant ascendancy, lawyers for the Catholic majority, Social clubs were separate. Jobs would be, you know, depend on your religion to statute degree, but office or whatever you might go into. So it was um, just, uh, it ended up being relief being put back into school. And a great feeling of true Christianity, as in the Boston Grammar School, which was at odds with um, some of the nuns seemed to hate children. And I mean, to go with it, a feel better with my confidence. Thank you for that. Um, Ron Gaskill, if you are from Bangladesh, again, wherever you are, or families, you are confronted with um, you know, this identity, who, who are you, and what kind of lifestyle you should adopt. So, there's some people say, you know, there is the Bengali culture, and this is our culture, and some people say, our culture is Muslim, our religion is Muslim. Um, Islam and so how much of this culture clash, you know, uh, some of this uh, woman that you have um, interviewed in terms of, you know, Bengali culture and Islamic culture, or Islamic religion, how much uh, are they experiencing and how they're dealing with it? You mentioned something a little bit, just like a little bit more, um, just a little bit more information or discussion on this. Um, well, I was, I was, it's okay, you can hear me now. Um, my research kind of showed the relationships with the family as being most vital in establishing this identity, first and foremost. Um, my, um, if, if you got on with your parents, if my respondents got on with their parents, then they were more, they were more likely to uh, say, yeah, Bengali culture is great, um, it's fine, we don't have a problem with it. And if they didn't, uh, and there, was a, there, was a, there was one of my respondents didn't fit in with Bengali culture, she didn't fit in with uh, British culture, so the only, so the only trajectory they, uh, she found was in through Islam, and she uh, uh, was it was a defense against, I think I spoke about her, she, it was a defense against everything. But uh, usually uh, it, it wasn't much of a culture clash um, in establishing identity. But, but then I don't think uh, uh, a lot of my respondents were vociferously Muslim. Um, they said, yes, this is what we identify with as religion, but we, it's not, it's part of me. Um, I've grown up in all kind of three cultures, so there's no hierarchy of uh, which I should give preference to. So it hasn't been much of a culture clash unless there have been tensions within the family. I don't know if that answers the question. Okay, do you want to come forward, please? It's okay. It's okay. Um, I'm really used to it in 15 minutes, so forgive me. But uh, all the presentations have been most excellent. After sort of a 15 year war of terror, and I'm in my 30s, so I remember what it was like in the year 2000, I'm intrigued to know what, to what extent academic, I mean, let's be frank about the world and what's happening right now in the political culture of Britain, which is currently breaking down and scandal in a way that will never recover. I mean, the video, banking, it's real, it's public, and it's happened, and it's going to keep happening for the next 10 years. 
these two countries in the free. In light of that, the British uh, Bangladeshis, who I would argue, just to offer, Sorry, to, to, to offer an insight, I would argue, have been British legally for 258 years. That's a legal fact in terms of taxpayer for Bangladesh and British India. I wonder when we understand the neocon political reality of funding and controlling uh, anti non white force in the war of terror in Britain and America. That how the word integration to a population that been here, in my case, 60, 65 years, my family, and in many other cases, even if they're later, in a line that, you know, even 100 years, and for Somalis and many other communities, a good 100 years in England, how useful the notion of integration is as an analytical tool in a culture where even the Scottish wants to leave. Devon, Devonians never call themselves English, ever, and have a big problem in their country with English immigrants into Devon. The Cornish are relearning Cornish. Like, this is, I'm showing you something that. I think it's very helpful to all our future lives. And that we cannot legally be called foreign, legally speaking. I mean, obviously, from another domain. That was the British Empire for 200 years. And we were soldiers in the First World War and Second World War, which has, of course, been suppressed in this media narrative for the last decade. In light of that, despite the war, we have understanding the problems and I appreciate that we have. Is it helpful to have a notion of integration? When half the English people I meet who are seen and not, and I'm generalizing on purpose to make a point about racism. When I generalize about people who are not actually native, because a lot of white people in London are actually from Eastern Europe from 100 years ago, but that's another story. That is this not a racialized discourse about integrating black, brown, and Muslim, when we're the most integrated people for the last 60 years with the language, education, classes, excuse me, gender, and also the phenomena of historic presence and legal, our legal connection and our psychological experience is extremely, in Bangladesh too, extremely anglicized. We're so anglicized, we want to learn Bengali because we think we're losing it, because we all speak English. And what I'm saying is that should we now look at changing the notion of integration and look at the notion of individual communities who are part ethnic origin and cultural origin, and of course totally British. And just to give one final point, all the little, I mean, I don't know the right the little thugs, the little criminals, the little trends or fashion I see in every part of England, or Asian culture, and even Afro-Caribbean culture in terms of Let's, let's say criminality, uh, fashion, is all originally Anglo. Anglo. So we add something to that. So if we have the notion of being integrated, black and Asian, after our historic presence and fact of presence, we will always be inferior. We will increase in inferiority levels, particularly for females, even if we're the most educated and successful, and we will always feel that we have to prove loyalty by exceptional and exceptional behavior. Whereas, to finish, if we live in a culture where there's epic drug taking, of the highest level, which is still illegal in middle class families, epic alcoholism, epic illegality of pervasive pedophilia in every single institution, with the official statement of 11.7 million victims by the government's own advice, we should blame ourselves for our own needs and behavior, but not have, in my opinion, a neutral, idealized, notional idea of England. And we must try and fit in when we're already here and fit in. You know, and this is my point about academic research. That is excellent research, all of the research is really helpful. But I think the time has come up for 15 years to realize it's not about integration for me. I mean, it's impossible for me to be integrated. It really happened. It's more about needs, cultural aspects, uh, religion, culture, gender, race, as it is for anyone else. And finally, I think ethnic minorities should contribute to white studies and the study of what's going on in Britain, which is a legal, actually a very famous study for all over the world in 50, 60 universities, understanding what's going on in Cornwall, Devon, which we actually lived in, and Grimsby, Manchester, London not have an inferiority complex of proving whiteness. And I think that would really help all our academic discourses to liberate us from our specific needs. Thank you. I'm just going to comment that you're not asking a question that's actually relevant to what she's been talking about. Well, I just, just, yeah, okay. just, you're just jumping on It's the okay, it's okay. We, 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 it's okay. Tear it up. And that's up to the speaker if she if she's decided to okay. not to answer because it's just a contribution. So okay, um, yes, do you want to say anything to the audience? I think I missed this other people. Nice questions. Can I, can I just um, say thank you very much for your contribution? Um, I thought it was very helpful. Um, I think my my work is yeah notions. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, yeah. notions of integration are. Um, yeah, I'm very, uh, very prevalent, obviously, uh, in, the, in the current um, political discourse and everything. Um, but 
my, 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 what I'm trying to do in my work is say, actually, we are part of the British society. Um, I can do my thesis if you want. We can, we can have lots of um, Yeah, so we are, we are part of uh, British society, and sometimes it's um, there, there's a guy whose name I can't remember, but he says that if we don't speak, we our voices aren't heard. So. Um, yeah, 